I've spent most of my career, as many of you know, as an advocate and community organizer, fighting for violence prevention from the grassroots up. And I must tell you, I am so energized to be here right now in a moment of change, opportunity, and transformation in the struggle against gun violence for our streets. Everyone in this room is part of a community committed to reducing firearm violence across the state. Together with the governor's leadership, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, Secretary Ho, our expert colleagues at the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, and members of the Illinois General Assembly, we will make a difference. We will work hand in hand, individually and collectively, to address the violence on our streets and invest in addressing the underlying root causes that cause so much despair, too much addiction, too little mental health, and too few opportunities. The plan we're part of today calls on us to focus on communities in Chicago and greater Illinois with the most concentrated violence. These community needs, and they will receive violence inter interruption, trauma-informed services, and programs to support young people to find a better way. By leaning in with compassion and focus to support communities that have endured so much loss, we can, we will make every neighborhood safer. That's the commitment. The Reimagine Public Safety Act gives Illinois a bold blueprint to stem violent crime in neighborhoods and communities that need our help. Through the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention, we will bring solutions based on research and data to the people and the communities that need it most. Nobody has been more supportive of this effort than our governor. I am proud to stand with so many today, and I am privileged to introduce our governor, a steadfast leader in the fight for our safer communities. Please welcome Illinois Governor J.B. Prisker. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for that very warm introduction. The state of Illinois truly is lucky to have you at the helm of our new Office of Firearm Violence Prevention. To the Chicago Alder women and men who are with us today and who've welcomed us to Washington Park, thank you for joining hands with the state in this very, very important work. I also want to welcome the leaders in the General Assembly, uh, without whom this initiative would not be possible, and I want to make sure you know who they all are. The sponsors, Senator Peters and Representative Slaughter, Leader Hunter, Leader Collins, Representatives uh, Robinson and Gonzalez, and I hope I haven't missed anybody. I don't think so. Um, they, along with their colleagues throughout the state, who supported this new public safety law are helping to reduce violence. And they're doing it in partnership with leaders in my administration here with us today. Of course, our great Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton. Director Del, yeah. <laughs> Director Del Reese Adams of the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority and Secretary Grace Ho of our Department of Human Services. In November, we announced a commitment of an additional $250 million to directly reduce violence in our neighborhoods. Today, the legislation that I'm signing will advance our commitment to make that unprecedented investment in public safety, utilize data to inform where help is most needed, address both immediate needs and systemic change to reduce gun violence, and most importantly, reach even more communities that have historically been left out and left behind. This wouldn't be possible without these leaders in the General Assembly. By working together, we are able to make a bigger impact sooner, with dollars getting out the door well in advance of the summer of 2022. That starts today. Applications are now open for groups who can help train community organizations on the front lines, organizations that will deliver evidence-based violence interruption and prevention, youth development, and trauma-based services. In the coming weeks, additional funding opportunities will be released for those frontline community partners all across our state. 
So that's the how of what we're doing. But I want to speak to the why. In the past week alone, we have lost a 39-year-old in Roseland, a 29-year-old in Grand Crossing, a 60-year-old in Little Village, young and old victims of gun violence. On Tuesday, a 71-year-old grandfather in Chinatown was shot 22 times while getting his newspaper. And there are the countless children who have been taken from us far, far too soon. Too much tragedy, too much loss. We are all here to say enough is enough. In this state, we are one Illinois and we stand up for one another. The people of Washington Park, of Grand Crossing, of Little Village, and Chinatown deserve to be safe. So do all Chicagoans and the people of Rockford and Peoria and East St. Louis and Champaign and communities up and down the state of Illinois. The problem is not unique, though, to cities in Illinois. Communities across the nation, like Philadelphia and Indianapolis, Austin and Portland, have been plagued by the scourge of rising violence. Indeed, they have reached record proportion. I came into this office committed to addressing the cycle of violence and its root causes. Poverty, disinvestment, lack of access to health care. That means investing in education and employment, in human services and mental health to neighborhoods that have been truly forgotten. Since taking office, my administration has more than doubled investments in programs to interrupt and prevent violence. That's before the $250 million in the Reimagine Public Safety Act. Uh, and the state is now, has now appropriated $507 million for violence prevention, diversion, and youth employment programs just in our fiscal year budget. On top of rebuilding our safety, uh, social safety net, these budgets have provided hundreds of millions of additional dollars to local governments and to community-based organizations to support vulnerable communities. In response to the devastating increase in highway shootings in Chicago, I've ordered the Illinois State Police to double their preventative patrol presence on the city's expressways. And we've installed already a hundred of the hundreds of license plate reading cameras around the region so that we can catch these deadly predators. My administration is adding hundreds of new troopers to the depleted ranks of the state police uh, with yet another cadet class starting this Monday. Remember that over many years, the state police ranks have been depleted. It's time for us to lift them up. And we're building a new state-of-the-art forensics facility and ending rape kit backlogs to help local law enforcement solve crime. If you want to reduce crime, we've got to solve crime. Last summer, working with the General Assembly, we enacted <laughs> Thank you. Um, last summer, uh, working with the General Assembly, we enacted the most comprehensive reform to our state firearms laws in over a generation, including universal background checks, universal background checks. And uh, through advancements in economic opportunity and health care and education and restorative justice, I've been very, very proud to stand with the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus who led our effort in making Illinois a national leader in tackling racism head on. No law can change the past or give back a life. Indeed, I wish we didn't have to live in a world where lives can be so thoughtlessly and easily stolen in the first place. But what we can do, we must do. And thanks to the reimagined public safety plan, we are putting unprecedented effort on the ground to save lives. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my partner in governance, my friend, and a friend to everyone in the state of Illinois, our Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton. Thank you so much, Governor Pritzker. Hello, everyone. 
Thank you, Governor, for that introduction. I am Juliana Stratton, and I use she, her pronouns. We are here to reimagine, to shape how public safety works and evolves in this state, to support communities and the families that call them home. Governor Pritzker, thank you for leading our great state with the health and safety of all Illinoisans in mind and with justice and equity rooted in the priorities of our administration. To my friends and former colleagues of the Illinois General Assembly, including Senator Peters and Representative Slaughter, thank you for envisioning a new path for our communities through your work on the Reimagine Public Safety Act. And thank you to all of the special guests that are joining us today that Governor Pritzker has already acknowledged. Thank you for being here and for your leadership. We know that the time to act against gun violence is long overdue because so many of us have endured its effects either directly or indirectly. And I say this as someone who has been directly impacted by gun violence, whose family has felt the pain and the trauma that it brings. And I know many of you in this room today share my story. Gun violence affects all of us as a state and we are all a part of the solution. And our cities, towns, and neighborhoods, and the people who live in them, who feel the effects of this epidemic, they are not the problem. It is the conditions our neighbors, friends, and loved ones inherited from failed policies and decades of disinvestment that perpetuate this violence. Today, with the signing of the Reimagine Public Safety Act, we are showing these communities that we are listening and we stand with them. Because they know what they need to move forward. And they have long fought to change those conditions. So, to the advocates and community leaders, some of whom join us today, I want to thank you for being on the ground every single day, showing that the way to make change is to act, and you all deserve a round of applause. We are following your lead, and we want you to know that we are all in. We are all in on equitable violence prevention that addresses root causes, all in on being proactive rather than reactive. We are all in on a new vision of public safety that we are building together. With that, I would like to pass it on to my friend and a powerful advocate for justice, equity, and opportunity in our state, one of the sponsors of this visionary legislation, Senator Robert Peters. Good afternoon. I want to first thank the governor for signing this today and all the work he has done around reimagining public safety. I want to thank the lieutenant governor for her amazing work when it comes to justice, equity, and opportunity. And I want to thank the governor's team, particularly Deputy Governors Andy Menar, So Flores, Secretary Ho, uh, Director Adams, and Assistant Director Patterson, as well as the legislative team for taking this on and for listening. And I want to thank the General Assembly for guiding this through uh, in the legislature. And most importantly, I want to thank the advocates who have been doing the work on the ground and who are the ultimate leaders for creating change when it comes to public safety in this state. It has been a very difficult, difficult two years. But for many communities, it has been a difficult few decades. It has been decades of cratering disinvestment filled with trauma and struggle. These periods of pain and anguish were only made worse by the crisis of the last two years. It makes me angry, sad, and upset that we are in this place and in this moment during this crisis. Leaders and members in our communities have been yelling for help, for help for years, and at one point they were met with the deafening silence of a budget impasse and institutions and services closed. 
For years, our approach to these struggles was built off a system that I would call a form of big government gone bad called mass incarceration. A system that did nothing to keep us safe and in fact disrupted lives and is contributing to a crisis we see today. This is, approach has meant that neighborhoods have been on fire and burning. And what we are seeing this year is that when there is fire, there is smoke. And now that this smoke has spread to everyone, all across the city and state, we need to deal with this smoke by putting out these fires. The Reimagine Public Safety Act is a pathway to putting out the fire. It will be a target, evidence-based, and compassionate program to interrupt, guide, and lift up communities who have been struggling. It will be diverse and focused in all areas all over the state, and it will be historic. We live in a world where we need to create true public safety for all and not a few. In med school, to be a particularly nerdy person during a serious discussion, they say don't go chasing zebras when you see a problem. So don't go looking for some surprising medical diagnosis, like tough on crime, I would say, when a more commonplace one exists. We must keep it simple even if the problem is complex. We must interrupt at the point of antisocial and nihilistic behavior. Work to treat the trauma that is leading to this behavior. Provide services and investment to the individual, the loved one, and the community, and keep track of people's well-being. Today we begin the work, and I am grateful to be part of it. Next up, my friend, an ally at the forefront of justice and a leader Representative Justin Slaughter. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Peters. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Illinois State Representative Justin Slaughter. I most certainly want to thank uh, Governor Pritzker and Lieutenant Governor Stratton for, for signing the Reimagine Public Safety Act, and for continuing, and it's, you, you really need to um, keep up with this administration, um, their commitment and dedication, their, their ongoing demonstrated dedication to prioritize public safety. Also want to give a big shout out to Department of Human Services, Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, my colleagues in the General Assembly. I also see uh, a few aldermen, a lot of aldermen that are also here. Thank you so very much for what you do for the city of Chicago. And of course, to the advocates, those that are in the trenches every day um, for your commitment to address violence prevention. Um, I think it's really important before we talk about the bill to give us uh, more context and really reflect on a very, very busy year as it pertains, pertains to matters regarding public safety. The, uh, actually, all the speakers have, have talked about this. This all begins with acknowledging that, unfortunately, systemic re racism does exist. And understanding that our criminal justice system adversely and disproportionately impacts underserved communities and people of color, both antidotally as well as when you look at the research. Uh, the governor touched on this. This is not just a problem that is germane to the state of Illinois. This is both a local and national issue. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, this year, what we've done here in Illinois is comprehensively address historical challenges within our criminal justice system. We've done this, and again, looking at what we've done all year with the three-prong approach, the Safety Act containing two of the prongs, both police and sentencing reform. 
today's bill containing the third component, which is violence and crime prevention. As we look at these policy initiatives, um, I think it's cr absolutely critical that we not entertain the option of turning back the clock to employ the old failed policies of the past that amount to lock them up, throw away the key approaches. We know actually that this is the reason that we are here today in the crisis-like challenges that we have. You've heard it before, we will not, we will not be able to arrest our way out of these challenges. The Reimagine Public Safety Act signifies a different and new approach. One that is not necessarily soft or hard on crime, but rather a smart on crime approach. And looking at what we've done this year, we do honestly believe in regards to police reform that training, body cameras, revamping our use of force policies, implementing a more robust decertification process puts our officers in a better position to succeed. When you look at mass incarceration with uh, sentencing reform, we believe that ending our cash bail system will bring about a more fair and just system and will allow us to prioritize violent offenses and be more smart on low-level nonviolent offenses. How does smart on crime look um, with the Reimagine Public Safety Act? First of all, the investment, <clears throat> the budgetary investment, $250 million over the next three years. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the largest investment of resources specifically dedicated to violence prevention in the history of Illinois. It's important. A lot of times, uh, and I guess City Alderman can tell you too, you can pass initiatives, but if the resources aren't there to implement them, um, it brings about another, another challenge. But secondly, secondly, interagency and intergovernmental partnerships. A primary objective of this initiative is to work across state agencies and with other levels of government to optimize our efforts and our impact. Extremely important that all levels of government are working in concert. Our neighborhoods, our communities throughout the state of Illinois deserve that from us. Third, and really the most significant difference in reimagining public safety is acknowledging violence as a public health crisis. Just over a month ago, the governor signed uh, an executive order declaring gun violence a public health crisis. What comes along with this new perspective is understanding that you can't look at violence in a silo, but rather understand the myriad of different socioeconomic factors that interface with our social determinants of health not really rocket science, where you see significant uh, lack of investments in education, economic development, housing, the environment, mental health services, you will also see a prevalence of violence. So it's this ability to coordinate all of our government programs and, and resources and, and, and services to address these issues. Another point I want to touch on is best practices and evidence-based practices. This bill creates an office of firearm violence prevention. We want to be national leaders in this space. This means prioritizing best practices and encouraging emerging practices. It really also means working with our, our legacy organizations and building them up 
organizations that have done this for, for many, many years. But it also means investing time and energy and resources in new uh, entities and organizations, um, grassroots organizations that want to start up and have an impact in this area. Lastly, we also know that violence prevention interventions solely by themselves will not solve this issue. We must continue to develop and strive for holistic, comprehensive community revitalization where it's needed most. This means leveraging federal resources, but it also fundamentally means changing government to bring about sustainable, positive outcomes. With the signing of this bill, we really feel that we're poised and, and well positioned to support many of our existing programs. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Stratton is here with us today. Um, we see this enhancing the Justice Economic Opportunity Initiative. We see this enhancing our R3 program, which Lieutenant Governor Stratton uh, leads. We also see us being positioned for some new innovative programs looking at utilizing Medicaid in an innovative way. Um, also, many of you hearing about an infrastructure bill that President Biden signing not too long ago. There are provisions in that law that um, are calling for violence prevention. We know that with the signing of this bill, Illinois will be poised to pull down those federal resources for some of these future endeavors. Listen, we've done a lot this year. We're extremely proud of our work. We look forward to reimagining our approach to public safety. And we will continue to do everything within our power to meet the unprecedented challenges of gun violence. This is public safety for all, not for a few. Public safety for all, regardless of what zip code that you live in. We're excited for 2022. We will continue to go from protest to progress. Thank you so very much. Uh, I, I now have the honor of, of bringing up uh, someone, and actually, personally, I'm excited about it. His congregation, I think, is near here, but is moving to the 27th district. I don't know Second when he's, church. wait, when is it? Second church. Second church, okay. But you gotta get there first, Pastor. Uh, but everyone, put your hands together for Pastor Chris Harris. I say good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to our governor and the lieutenant governor, to all of these great leaders in this room, and to Lottie Dottie and everybody, uh, this is a good day. Everybody in here uh, are committed uh, to building up our city. The folks who provide the resources, fight for the resources, and those who take the resources and actually do the work on the ground, please do me a favor. Go crazy in this room for this great day, everybody. Come on. As shared, I'm Pastor Chris Harris and founder and CEO of Bright Star Community Outreach. I pastor Bright Star Church here in the greater Bronzeville area, as well as St. James Church in the West Pullman area out there in the hundreds. And we serve thousands of residents uh, in the greater Bronzeville community particularly. And with me today are various community leaders and stakeholders and constituents that represent a collaborative of more than 100 community-based, faith-based, school-based organizations who have partnered together uh, to implement essential programs. Now, this also includes Dean Deborah Gorman-Smith of the Crown Family Schools, uh, Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention. Together, we have been implementing a community-wide, data-informed, coalition-based approach uh, to violence prevention since 2015, led by Bright Star Community Outreach, this collaborative has actively engaged literally tens of thousands of community residents, and this partnership has achieved substan substantial progress in efforts to uh, identify and deliver high-quality programs for youth and families, uh, to advance educational equity for all schools in the greater Bronzeville footprint, uh, to increase the resilience of people affected by trauma and violence, provide employment and placement services for residents of the greater Bronzeville area and reduce crime and violence at a community level. 
Now, driving the success of this approach has been our development of what we call the Greater Bronzeville Community Action Plan. Drafted after community-led work groups collected the data, and we reviewed the community profile and resource assessment and prioritized domains for community planning. That's the exciting part. Uh, the Community Action Plan is focused on four key areas. Violence prevention areas, that's implementing school, family, and community-based interventions. Mental health support and trauma-informed care. Education, as well as workforce development. Now, analysis conducted to test the impact of the model that we've implemented on crime and violence at the community level when compared with similar communities around Chicago found significant differences and reductions in violent crime, violence, including robberies, aggravated assaults, shootings, and homicides. Now let me translate that. We're seeing a 14% drop in robberies, a 10% drop in aggravated assaults, and a 17% drop in shootings. In addition, to supporting programs in each of the key target areas. That's family and school-based programs, trauma-informed care, education, uh, you all, as well as workforce development. We hypothesize uh, three key mechanisms leading to reductions in crime and violence at the community level. Increased capacity of the community-based organizations. Let me say it again. Increased capacity for the community-based organizations. Third time for the Holy Ghost. Increased capacity for the community-based organization. Don't ask us to do the work until you give us the resources. It's like a hungry, hungry hippos game. They throw money out on the table and everybody try to grab it. Now it's time for us to collaborate and then concentrate and then make sure we build up the folks, y'all gonna clap on this, that do the work all the time. And then let's strengthen and support our community coalitions. Where there's proper investment, my colleagues, there should be a return on investment. And we need to respect the fact that we shouldn't ask for dollars without data, we shouldn't ask for money without metrics, and we shouldn't try to expand without evaluation. That's called accountability. And I cannot express enough how thankful I am for this funding that will support boots on the ground organizations that are committed to intervention and prevention efforts to address this violence. I'm particularly grateful that some of those funds are going to go to mental health efforts. This is desperately needed. This is desperately needed. And Bright Star Community Outreach's trauma helpline and trauma-informed efforts such as putting care rooms, care and resilient environment rooms in the various schools have touched more than 50,000 students and residents because of our collaboration. But much more is needed. Everybody say, much more, much more. is needed. Yeah. Now say, much more, much more is coming. You ought to clap your hands for the signing of this bill. And these funds can potentially scale and replicate this work. Again, thank you, Governor Pritzker. Thank you so much, Chris Patterson. We're looking forward to your leadership. And act like you at my church. Look at somebody better looking than you are right now and tell them, say nothing. Come on, I said, look at somebody better looking. Y'all ain't got nobody better looking than you? Come on, tell them, say nothing until you do something about violence and trauma. Make some noise in here, everybody. I'm proud to bring up my sister from another mister. Clap your hands for Angela Herlock. How do you ever come behind that? How do you ever come behind that? So I was thinking about what I was going to say. You know, you put together things you want, really want to say, and I am in awe. When you look around this room, look at the people who are doing the work. I definitely give honor to our, our governor and our lieutenant governor and our elected representatives that take the voice and they do the action so we have the resources. But I want you to look around the room at the people who are on the streets every single day doing this work, every single day loving families, Every single day, helping people to put down a gun and pick up a key to an apartment. Put down a gun and pick up a job. I am moved because 25 and a half years ago, I stood over a coffin 
of my young cousin. And there weren't these types of resources. Now we have these kind of resources. We have people who are out on the streets, organizations who are out doing the work so people can put down the guns, pick up a job, pick up a home, just pick up a hand and say, you know what, there's a better way than this. But we can't do it alone. It's got to be everybody here doing it together. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Everybody has a piece of it. This is just, this isn't even the beginning. The beginning has been coming because we've been doing this work. This is the middle that's going to get us to the end. The end when we can say, wow, I remember when there used to be a lot of guns in Chicago and in other places all around the state. We don't want those here. We want to see our kids grow up. I looked back there and saw my colleague with the little baby back there. That's going to be growing up. That's our future. But if we can't make them get here, we're not doing our job. That's what this is about. $250 million is a lot of money. And then it's not really a lot of money. So we got to use it wisely so that there'll be more. It is my honor to bring up our wonderful governor so he can sign this bill. Once again, I want to say thank you to the people behind me who made this happen, the members of the General Assembly who worked so closely together to get this done, uh, and of course to uh, all of the elected officials and all the leaders of the organizations who have pushed and prodded uh, to make sure that our General Assembly and our governor and all the leaders across the state understand the importance of investing in the interruption of violence, investing in lifting up our communities. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions from members of the media. I see Marianne. Thank you, Governor. The, uh, the Illinois Senate GOP opposed this, but the House GOP did not. Uh, what's your response to that? Because it's been going on for quite a while. Yes. Yeah. 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 Maybe I should ask members of the General Assembly who talk to him maybe more often than I do. I, I will say that I can just say this, that, that uh, Republicans have only been calling for uh, more time in prison for people. They've only been calling for uh, cracking down and being, uh, you know, just uh, slogans around law and order. What we do, what we Democrats have done, is actually invest in fighting crime and actually investing in our communities, investing in the community organizations that make a difference on the ground. Well, let's be clear what people are saying. 
What they want is to make sure that our streets are safer. What they want is for us to invest in violence interruption. What they want is what's in this bill. What they want is to make sure that we're investing in the patrols of our highways like we are doing with our state police. What they want is to make sure that we're addressing the underlying causes of violence in our communities, and that is what we are doing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the application process, as I said a little earlier, begins today. Um, we are accepting those applications. We'll be uh, opening other parts of the bill's process for accepting applications and granting those funds over the next weeks and a couple of months. The idea is to make sure that we get those dollars in the hands of the organizations that matter on the ground enough before the summer season, before we start to see the thawing from you know winter and into the spring, uh, because we know that's where there is an uptick in violent crime often. And we also know that there are young people that need jobs, that want to work during the summer. If we give them an alternative, they will take it. And we are attempting to do that as quickly as possible. And I'm looking forward to making sure that we're pushing those dollars out the door. But I do encourage the organizations that are eligible right now to go ahead and apply. Yes. Look, every time there is a COVID death, uh, it affects me. And every time we see an uptick of cases and then upticks of hospitalizations, uh, Dr. Azike and I are in close touch about what do we need to do next. I want to remind you that in the state of Illinois that we have some of the most stringent mitigations that you can have right now. In fact, we're one of only six states that has a mask mandate for indoors. And thank you all for following that today, keeping each other safe. Uh, we are sending monoclonal antibodies to hospitals across the state and have been for weeks now, uh, and making sure that there are home healthcare infusion uh, programs for people across the state who may not want to go to the hospital, may get sick, but may not want to go to the emergency room of a hospital, and so that we can provide that in their homes to keep them out of the hospitals, which ultimately we would want to do. But I just want to remind everybody, and I know I sound like a broken record, that if you are not vaccinated, please get vaccinated. Please, please get vaccinated. It will keep you safe. And if you have not been boosted with a booster, Please go get boosted. It's literally multiple times the protection that you got from the original vaccination. So go do that. I've done that. I want to encourage all of you to do that, and especially our seniors, our grandparents, uh, and parents who, who can get boosted. They need to go get boosted. Lastly, your 5 to 11-year-olds. By the way, Illinois is leading in the Midwest in getting 5 to 11-year-olds vaccinated. I'm very proud of that. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for asking now. Let me just, I want to turn it over to Rep. Slaughter uh, and perhaps Senator Peters as well, but uh, to answer the question, but let me just say this. From the beginning, and I've told you this from long ago, uh, I believe that we have to invest in the communities that have been left out. Um, for far too long, truly, just governor after governor and for decades on end, people have just overlooked the communities that really needed the dollars like we're putting in here, not just for violence intervention, but also for providing jobs. And how about health care that everybody needs, mental health and substance abuse treatment. Um, these are all things that we've invested in in our uh, administration. And it's because I really believe that if you want to address crime, if you want to address the challenges that communities are having, go to those most vulnerable communities and, and build those up from underneath. Build a foundation so that pe people can build a better life. But can I just ask uh, Representative Slaughter if you want to 
Because you, you guys put this plan together. Well, no, I think, us, yeah. I Thanks, Mr. Gar. I think it was a, a couple things. One, understanding the critical moment these last couple years have taught us in terms of the um, disparities mm -hmm. in regards to what the, the pandemic has uncovered as well as uh, the violence. We were really looking at, um, I think, trying to do all three prongs that I mentioned in lame duck. We got two in the Safety Act. We just used this session to get the third, the third prong. In regards to the um, looking at violence as a public health crisis, really a lot of folks have been talking about that for a really long time. We thought it was the, the, the time was right to codify what that meant into policy. Uh, all of us know that you can't really change anything until you start with, with, with policy. So we wanted to codify that and what that meant in both the executive order that the governor just signed, but as well as the highlighted points that both Senator Peters and I touched on in the um, Office of Firearm Violence in, within the state. Most definitely. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Nope. We have one right here. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. South Suburban Casino. You know, they're an independent body. Um, they are focused, as you know, on making sure that they get it right, that, the, you know, there are a lot of applications that come in, as you know, multiple for that location, although it got uh, downsized to two competing ones. But, but I can just tell you that it's an independent body. They make those decisions on their own. Uh, I do not believe that they overlooked equity as a consideration, but, but they made the decision that they made. And, and I'm pleased, finally, that we're going to have this economic development tool for the South Suburbs. So, thank you.